My name is Daryl Hill uh, from Catherine in the Territory. I operate a small one man consultancy business called Soil Save and over here in Kelly running erosion control workshops. Erosion, there is natural erosion, the rivers and creeks are natural, but what's not natural is the, roads, the soil loss off the access roads. And we've got to have access, we've got to be able to stop fires, we've got to be able to check water points, we've got to be able to cattle in and out. So we've got to minimise the soil loss off our roads and access tracks. And that's the part that here, the Broome NRM region, as in all regions of Australia, uh, becoming very conscious of the amount of so topsoil we're losing, one of Australia's biggest exports. So as I, I did a, a, a run through the West Kimberleys in June, I think it was. So I'm back here to repeat visit now, so uh, here at Kalieta, Morita, back through to Napier Downs and yeah, just on behalf of uh, Broome NRM. Mm. So we've got a hillside for 30,000 years, water has been coming off that hillside, flowing down through to the creek, we've got no erosion problems. We come in and put in some form of infrastructure, and be that a pipeline, road, fence line, whatever it is, it's like setting the fuse to a time bomb. And in this case, it might be a set of Toyota wheel tracks across the flat. Every time we drive down that, every time we grade it, every time a mob of cattle walk along that track, whatever it is, we're blowing on the fuse. And it'll sit there for a couple of decades, 20, 30 years, we get an unusual rainfall event, four or five inches an hour, or 10 inches overnight, and we get a blowout down here. And people will blame that rainfall event on creating the washout. To me, that's bullshit. It's the time bombs finally exploded. We have noticed our signs that our windrows are getting deeper, our wheel tracks are getting deeper, that we're diverting the water from its natural flow direction through our own management, our management practice and stuff like that. So that's what happened now. We started putting some form of uh, erosion control measure. So we build a bank up in here. So there's a twofold purpose of that. In one, you get a, that four inches an hour, comes off the escarpment, comes down, hits the road, it's starting to, now it's been, been diverted this way. So that bank's going to get rid of the excessive flows in a wet year, but it's also in dry, reinstating the flows in a, in a dry year. Because that, when it rains, this whole area gets 25 mil of rain. So there's five mil soaking in, the other 20 mils moving over. As it's moving over, it's soaking in. So the rain, you know, you see the little anchor displays where the raindrop hits the ground and a bit of explosion, a bit of a splatter back. So it's losing its energy as it comes through here. It depends on the amount of grass and vegetation. Once it gets in our wheel tracks, it starts going this way. So the area below that has had the same 25 mil of rain, but it hasn't had the advantage of that other 20 mil soaking in. So it's not uncommon in red desert country, you come along and see good grass on one side of the road, bare areas on the other and then you'll, find, you'll start finding grass again, 15, 20, 50 metres away. It's because that roadway or that fence line is steering the water this way instead of pushing across. So you build an erosion control measure, it gets rid of the excessive flows in a wet year, but reinstating the flows in a dry year. Coming on that. It comes up in conversation quite often that the average, even on that DVD, um, the average station operator will copy what the highway people do. Now every person here that taught, somebody taught you how to drive a grader, kid who taught you how to drive a grader or tractor? Somebody said get on it, that lever does that, that lever does that, get in and have a go, you're self-taught. When it doesn't matter if it's a bobcat or whatever it is, there's no room on the, so you've learned by following the previous examples, the previous operator. Um, so in this instance I put a bit of shit back on the highway people. So here's, in this case, it's a double line bitumen road all the way through. So they put in V-drains. Big wide drains at the top and they run off, you'll see them anywhere. Some of them that long, you need to cut lunch to find your way back here. Um, so the drain, it, their charter is to provide a safe high dry road. I've got no problem with that, but not at the sacrifice in the environment. So the water comes down there, gets the drain and flows off. It's not uncommon for these to wash out. So they're feeding more water in the washout, the washout's eating back up again, all that sort of stuff. Now these are never surveyed. They're done by an untrained operator that's self-taught by following the, it, their techniques evolved, evolved 200 years ago, 200 years ago by Governor Bly when they crossed the Blue Mountain Ranges. They didn't work then, they're still, and they didn't work in England, here we are still doing them to this day. What about the drain on the high side of the road? How good is that? And you'll see it going back into town this afternoon, back on the highway here. Most of Australia's highway flood damage is done on the high side of the road. This water can get away because it's downslope. There's a slope running towards the creek. 
This water here can't. Now these are big wide drains again, same thing, V drains. The operator goes down them, um, cuts from the centre out that way, backs up, puts his blade on the other angle. So he gets down there, you'd have a drain five metres wide at the top, one wheel width wide at the bottom, so it's a big funnel. And these are effectively plugged because there's a mob of scrub there, he can't get in the scrub. So they're plugged, so they're water, that, they'll only hold a certain amount of water. Once that's full of water, the water continues coming on down here until it finds a creek or a water course to get across. So 90% of Australia's flood damage is done on the side of the road. The worst thing that highway people do is quite often, not so much in this area, they put a big drain parallel to the road to catch all the water before it gets to the highway. They should be illegal. If anybody puts one of those in, should be given a plane ticket reward, one-way plane ticket. But anyway, the, all government agencies right across Australia do that. Now, if that ground's running that way, why did that drain need to be that long? It's because they had, weren't surveyed. They were done by eye. He thinks you need a big, long drain. Really, all you need is a couple of metres because the ground's running that way. He didn't need that big, long drain. Another thing is, there's only three structs I'm going to talk about here today. is flat drains, a check bank, and a diversion bank. And most of my emphasis is going to be on the worst case scenario stuff on this diversion bank. But at the moment, still back in flat bottom drains. Now, that's a recommendation art is now that instead of putting in a V drain, which is exactly what it says, what's the first letter in the word velocity? Is V. So these things are going to take the water off the ray, but they're not taking the energy out of the water. They're not taking the force out of it. So we start looking at flat bottom drains, like that, designed to let the water spread out, take the force out of it, but they're all starting to, starting to put more emphasis on the environment. So in this instance, a flat bottom drain had come like that. Their highway drains run like that, but ours are starting to come like that. So we bring this up. Now, a standard method of maintaining a V drain is to go down it, what we're starting to do now is bring soil back up. Because every road on your place is losing soil. Every time you drive down, you see the dust blowing away. So where's that soil going to be replaced from? It's going to have to come from outside. We haven't got the tip trucks, the dozers and loaders and all the gear to bring material back in. So it's now our grade is starting to work that way. We bring soil back up to tie into the road. That acts as a training bank, pick the water up, put it in there. It gets out, we're taking, it's what it is. It's not the volume of water that's doing the damage. It's the speed that water's travelling at. It's the velocity of the energy in the water. So these V drains aren't designed to take the energy out, but a flat bottom drain is. The full width of the loader bucket or the grader, whatever we can fit in, we're starting to bring soil back up. And I'm not sure what happens here today where we're going, but quite possibly it'd be an opportunity to put a flat bottom drain in and bring that soil back up to tie into a check bank. Let's come back to our drawing. So we've got a road across the property somewhere. People start putting in erosion control measures. And when you first start doing this sort of stuff, you're only 35% effective. I'm better than that because I've done so much of it. And when people start doing stuff by eye, it's always at right angles to the infrastructure, right angles to the fence line, the roadway or whatever. Like you mentioned that your dad built something out here. Did he survey them? No, it would have been done by at right angles to the road because that's the best for the traffic. Now, what it is that when I say 35%, he thinks the water's going to come down through, he gets through the windrow, come this way, flow off that way. If it's not taking the force out of it, it's not fully effective. It's had to take the energy out. Um, the most common problem with doing it as a boy eye is that we hope the water's going to go that way. The most common problem is coming around the wrong way back in again. So it hasn't got rid of the water. It's had a slight effect in taking some of the force out of it. It steered it around, but it steered around the wrong end back into the road again. So it hadn't got rid of it, hadn't got rid of it. Take. The suit that's drawing the bank should be like that. So the water's coming in and that, it's bending the water, we're trying to take the force out of it. That's not ideal for our vehicles. You know, a Toyota Land Cruiser across that, or body truck going across that, his chassis is going to twist, his top coat's going to break and all that sort of stuff. But we're starting to put more emphasis on the environment than on our traffic. Because who's to say that we can't shift that road? That's all it is, it's a simple matter of the grader going half a blade wide, swing out a bit so we can actually cross over the bank at right angles. That's what we're starting to put more emphasis on the environment. Let's come back to the check bank, five to eight metres by eye. And as the commentator said, did anybody pick who that commentator was on that DVD? None of you as a country music fans, so I can see that. It's old Ted, Ted Egan. Um, he was a mate to the film crew. But what we're starting to do now, we're putting more emphasis on the environment. Now, I'll work by five to eight metres by eye, scratch up a little bit of windrow soil, build a bank over the road and that sort of stuff. But when a road is badly eroded, in this case, you get some of the black soil places, 
uh, down around Caulfield and Longreach. Yeah. You come back and they tell you you haven't got erosion because they can drive on their roads six, six metres wide, they can drive longer than at 80k an hour. They haven't got an erosion problem. When you start looking and find out their road is a foot deep, 30 centimetres, you know, that deep down below ground level. So, okay, if we drew it like slices of bread, three, four, five, six, if that road is 30 centimetres deep and six metres wide, every one metre of roadway is two cubic metres of soil. So basically four tonne of dirt gone for every one metre of roadway. And you hear these people think they haven't got an erosion problem. So where's all that dirt gone? What's Australia's biggest export? Water. Every river, basically a few that flow down and lake air goes to the sea. But that's renewable. What is not renewable is the contents in that water flow. There's 600 million tonnes of topsoil goes out of Australia every year. I don't know how much coal and iron ore goes out of Australia, but 600 million tonnes of topsoil. So Australia's biggest, and that's not renewable. So, um, anyway, so if we need to... We've got a roadway coming down here. We've got a big washout down here. We want to put a bank over the road. Our road is deep. <coughs> How do we, where do we find the dirt? We haven't got a loader. We haven't got a tip truck. We haven't got a dozer to top pop. Well, we haven't got any decent material anyway. <coughs> so what we do is dig a hole out in here and use that dirt out of that hole to put a bank over the road. Now that's been surveyed. I'm going to use the five to eight, I'll use five to eight metres by eye. But once I get over that, I'm going to survey it. Because it's going to take half an hour of that grader to put a bank in. An average cost, it's going to cost $75 to put one of those in. We want to make sure that we're not wasting our money putting in that it's not going to work. It's not going to work successfully. Um, so that's where we're going, to go, we're going to survey it. So that's what I'm saying here before is that we've got the surveying gear. I won't be doing any surveying. I'll teach you people how easy it is to survey. Basically, this is standard surveyor's tripod. In the old days, they were wooden and bamboo and all this sort of thing. Now they're all under This is a, what's called a dome tripod, which makes the next step a bit easier. In the old days, you'd get one of these and they'd be flat. They're still OK. You can still buy them. But the dome tripod, if anybody's thinking about chasing up this sort of gear, make sure you get one of these dome ones. Because this is just a basic standard dumpy level, theodolite. But what this does, this screws onto here. Um, and because this is domed, this, to be effective, this has to be level. It's got a little bubble here in the circle, a uh, little bubble that's got to come into the circle. Um, take the lens cap off. What we do to get this level, we screw onto here, thread under this is standard, brand new thread. Come out of the broom nuts and bolts yesterday, this dumpy level. Screws onto there, and we've got to move this around on the dome to get the bubble in the circle, just in there. Do it up tight. Quick as that, that's set up ready to go. In the old days, you had the flat top one. You had to screw it on. You, you got the, the flat top tripod level by eye. You screwed the, put the level on, and then three little wheels. And it's like, yeah, like when you yard build it. You want the, or build a shed or something. You want the bubble in the middle on the level. So you take the high side down on the low side up. The same here. To get this, you just adjust the wheels to get the bubble in the circle and that sort of thing. But as quick as that to set up, what that is, is like a glorified telescope. We set it up on a sloping bit of ground, put the tripod up, set the level on that. When we look through the level, it's got a main horizontal line, a vertical line, a couple of little ones up in here. That big one through the centre is the one we're going to use for our up and down and that sort of stuff. Now when you look at this, this particular level, and you look through it, it's got a little diamond up the top here. You line that up on the tree or the windmill or the power pole, whatever it is, you have to adjust the focus, which is this one here. It's like a pair of binoculars, you focus them in. So you adjust that to get it clear. Um, you look through the eyepiece, you know, everybody's eyesight's slightly different. If you can't see the crosshairs, you can adjust the eyepiece, this little bit in here, adjust that, the cat's whisker will lighten or darken the crosshairs. Um, anyway, that, that'll sit there, we set it up, when you look through it, that main horizontal line, all you look through it is dead level line and tell us absolutely nothing by itself until we use our staff. In this day and age, they're all metric staffs and that sort of thing. They stretch out oh, and lock into place. So this would be a, four, four, a five metre staff. So each one of these little squares is a centimetre. 
like for example, take that 15 there, that's 1.5 metres from there down to the floor. It's just a glorified tape measure. Each one of the little squares is a centimetre. So that's 15, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, decimal currents becomes 1.6. The only requirement to use this ability, count, add and subtract from 1 to 10. Um, now the significance of the colours is every metre is a different colour. So when a surveyor, September, October, he could be 500 metres away, he can't see the numbers, but he can see the colours and he can see these big E's. Those big E's just rep represent a block of five. So if he's a couple hundred metres away, he can't see the numbers. But on this particular staff, the even numbers are on the left, the odd numbers are on the right. So it's zero, two, four, it's up in here somewhere, it's an even number, it's six. That line here shimmering in the heat through there, I'll call that one, six, five. That's the full significance of the colours and the E's, just so we can see them over a long distance. Now I'm in the land care. When we go out in the field there this morning, this afternoon, if a line is through there, on a dumpy line is through there, we need to call that 165 or 166. It doesn't worry me. I'm not worried about millimetres, because a blade of grass, a leaf, a little bit of kangaroo shit on the ground, that sort of stuff. If we're building a skyscraper, we've got the millimetres on the back. So we can get that accuracy. But today, it's like when you go to town, you're more worried about how many dollars in your wallet than how many cents are in your pocket. So it's the same thing here. You're just going to the nearest decimal point and that's it. So in that case, that's 165. We call that 166, something like that. So we're starting to get some information. So we put our staff up here, take a reading here, 1.5. Go down the slope, take a reading down here, 2.5. That means there's a metre of fall that way or a metre of rise. There's no scientific bearing to that. It depends on how that's been set up. That's been set up to suit my height. But if a young fellow over here set it up, it's going to, like he might get different numbers, but the information's still the same. It just depends on how high that's been set up. So right now, because the more you understand this a little bit, the easier when I come back onto the, the handouts in that minute, we'll go out in the shade out here, set this up, and do a couple of little exercises to get everybody to have a look through it and play with it. It's just a glorified, same as the pliers are, or the chainsaw in the back of the ute or something like that. Although we don't throw this in the back of the Toyota. Now there's three wheels under there, Jardine. If you're moving a third wheel, it means you're overcorrecting. Right, it's like when you're putting a rail in the cattle yards, you don't bash it with a sledgehammer, you tap it with a shoeing hammer. That's the same thing. And if you're right-handed, the rule of thumb says that if you put two thumbs on those wheels, the bubble will go to your right thumb. Because it's, it's a stronger hand. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got to work out, okay, if you want the bubble one side, you move the opposite wheel. Either raise or lower it. Yeah. Always put the legs right out, James, because the wider the legs, no, right down, tend them right down. <laughs> yeah. They go a long way, these legs. Yeah. No, because like what happens is... The wider it is, the more stable it is. And so that's when you say you go around and anchor them down. And, but yeah, the wider the base, it, you know, it's not going to blow over in a whirlwind or a bloody wieners bump or something like that. I thought I was pretty close to the bubble to start, Daryl, but it's tricky. Yeah, we've got two different levels, two different machines. They're all interchangeable. The thread underneath there is standard right throughout the world. Doesn't matter what brand and breed and everything you've got. Really? Yeah. Yeah, look, all the functions on that are exactly the same as the functions on this. Yeah, it, it all does the same, you know, different, different manufacturing, different prices and all that sort of stuff. This one is a little old one because it hadn't got the adjustment legs under it. Yeah. Hold the base, yeah. The first time I've seen one of those with those little screws to adjust it. The other, well, everything else has got the wheels on them. Have they? Yeah, 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 right, yeah. yeah. But it's the same thing, you just adjust it. Fine. Anyway, have a look through it. Focus them, play with them. Tom, get into them.
around and have a look. <laughs> you have a look at the back of the quarters, you'll have to focus it in again. Or that tree over behind that truck. Every time you look around, that's all it's doing is looking on a dead level line. And whatever you look at, you've got to refocus it again. So if you look at that quarters there, focus in and back on the truck and all that sort of stuff. If you look at this now, that's probably looking way over that bloody tree line 2k away. Because we're up high here. That's all it's doing is looking on a dead level line. Can you see them crosshairs? Yeah, I can see them. Yeah. Now, all these wheels do. See these little ones here, they just for surveyors, they just move it very slowly. That's a bit buddy. Yeah, just see how it's moving? So we don't use those in our field, we just spin it in by hand. Righto. There's a couple of things this thing these things can do for you. James, did you know that your you know you can measure distance with this? Yeah. Hey? Yeah, with that one, you can measure distance with this. Righto, just come back onto here. Now you take a look. It's the first time he's had a look through one. I want you to focus on the staff and give me a reading on the staff. Now it's going to take him a couple of minutes to work out where he is. But Tommy's done five or six readings, he knows he's right to be quick as. So by the time he's got to learn, he's got to focus it in and he's going to try to work out well, where are we, the nearest centimetre. Um, hey? One point four. Right at the bottom. Yeah, well that's one point four there. So where's the line? Tell me to go up and down. Just above the E on that next dot. Here. Through here somewhere. So that's either 145 or 146, yeah. whatever you want to call it. So we put it down as 146. Yeah. Now, can you see these little short hairs here? You know. so when you look through that, can you see them too? Uh, yeah, if I look, like yeah. I put it down or up. They're called the upper and lower stadia hairs. And the difference between those two multiplied by 100 is, is the distance. Now, how far do you reckon that staff is away from here? 20 metres, 30, 40, 50? So, okay, you just give me that 146 there. Give me the reading on this bottom, this little bottom line down in here. Yeah, it's about one, yeah, 1.4. 1.4, spot on. Okay, the top one. So the first little red square? Yeah. No, the second one, the middle one. Okay, so 152 then something. Yeah. No worries. It depends on how he's averaging out. Yeah, so yeah. anyway, the difference. The of that. Yeah. The difference between those two, we've got 151 and 140. Difference 11 centimetres. Pied by 100 is 1100 centimetres. Shift the decimal point, it's 11 metres from there to there. <laughs> he, um, what it was when you gave me that first reading, 146. Yeah. Ah, sorry, 6, you're right, too. I added it up wrong. The difference between those two is 6 centimetres. So I added 6 onto that, should have been 152, which is your figure anyway. Yeah, yeah. So I was checking that you read them too right. Yeah. Because I wrote that figure in before, I wrote 151 in. It was my bad mathematics. I stuffed up. I added 5 instead of 6. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, <I was laughs> but <thinking laughs> the difference between those, now the thing is with that, is the level doesn't have to be level to measure distance. I've got to stop doing this. Say we're on the, the top of a hill, you've got a tank up on top of the hill, you're putting a new cattle trough in. Normally you just take a speedo reading, how many calls of polypipe you need. There's a set of cattle yards in there, or a hole in the laneway you can't drive through. Set your level up on here, the offsider goes down to the staff, you take those two readings, and the level doesn't have to be level, because to look down the hill, all you do is tip the legs. Oh shit! So you're looking down the hill, or well, you're looking up the hill. The level doesn't have to be level to measure distance. So you look down, in this case I want to look down that slope to measure from here to that big ant bed way over there. I just tip the level so I'm looking down. Now I can see that ant bed buddy way at, you know, kilometre over there. Hold the staff up, it's clop, you know, whatever it is. So, um, but the thing is that, now another thing with that is that, okay, you've got a generator shed here, 
um, shearers quarters over here you're going to run a power line through. You can't drive through the creeks full of water. You've got to remember that if you measure that distance for a power line, it's a dead straight line. So if you've got poles in there, you're going to have a sag in your, in your power line, something like that. So you're going to add an extra four or five metres. Because that's a straight line, that's a dead metre. Now another thing this thing can do is, you look around underneath here, it's got a little zeroing point. So I can turn this around to find zero, which is just here, just there. So I'm set this up over a fence line. I've got it up high, I turn that at right angles, so there's a right angle bend. I can peg corners with it. I can peg beds. I can, for example, NRM office in Broome is going to give you funding to build a one hectare enclosure to stop wombats. Um, what you can, <laughs> wallabies, whatever. So what it is, in the kit, you'll have a look, there's a little hook underneath here, and there's a plumb bob comes in the kit, so you can put this straight over a point. So you set your tripod up in here, uh, hectares 100 metres by 100 metres. So your offsider walks away from you, lines up until you've got a one metre reading between the upper and lower stadia line. That means he or she's 100 metres away. You mark that point, you zero, you level in on that line, turn it 90 degrees, your offsider walks across here, goes backwards and forwards till you've got that one metre reading with the vertical line. So there's two sides of a holding paddock. There's your peg underneath there. So there's two sides of a holding paddock proper square, perpendicular, everything. So now you shift station, you shift the level over to one of them. You can walk it sideways to the plumb bob till you're right over that peg, zero it back in, zero it on that line, turn it 90 degrees, so the, the offside will walk right. So there's your square paddock, your holding paddock, or your dam, you know, you're pegging out a dam on a creek line or something like that. So this can peg your dam, peg your yards, measure the distance, tell you how far you've got to buy, how many cores of poly pipe you've got to buy and all that. It's not only just to tell you up and down you know, when you're building sheds or whatever. One thing that will happen in long distance, say you're on a, you know, this country here, fairly flat, um, get your tripod up there, you look, there's your level line, so you take your reading here, see there's some two stadia lines? As that staff goes back, so do those two lines get, and eventually you come back far enough, that'll one, it'll run in the grass, you won't be able to see it. Now it's the same thing, when you're using the I'll, I'll do a scenario on the whiteboard you can put it in the handouts because it's not something you're going to remember. It's not something you're going to use often. But the fact that you know, you know that a dumpy level can measure distance. A lot of builders never knew that. So what it is, those two by 100. Now when he gave me them figures, I added you know, the bottom one to that one because that one's exactly halfway. You can still always see this one and that one. So those two then you multiply by 200. Like that one there and that one there by 200, you'll come up with the same figure. So when he gave me, before it was, uh, yeah, 140, 146, 152, um, yeah, which is 12 centimetres difference, so 200, 12 metres. Yeah, actually 12 metres, well, not bloody 11, because my mathematics, I added five instead of six. So yeah, anyway, anyway, it's all good. We'll come back into the classroom, get our handouts, so on that instance, slope, slope percentages are worked out over 100 metres. So 100 metres of country that's dead flat is 0% slope. So we come down 20, 40, 60, 80. One metre of fall over 100 metres is 1% slope. So as simple as that. A 5% slope is 5 metres fall in 100. We're going to do that out here shortly before we leave. Just work out the slope. We've definitely got a slope here. We'll work out the slope percentage and it's a bit of lawn and exercise. So the slope percent now, write down as much as you like or as little as you like because this is the stuff that I can embarrass these couple of fellows that went to last year and ask them, what was the figure I stressed? And they're going to tell me they can't remember it. Um, Chris might. <laughs> you probably would have wrote, what was that figure I stressed last year when you're designing a bank, pegging a bank? I think I might have called it the Shane Warne Cricket School. Don't worry about it, don't worry about it. No, no, what it is, the slope percentage we're going to be using here today, and I'm saying that some of you young fellows here now, 10 years time you won't know where you're going to be. But this slope percentage will work all over Australia. It's fast enough that water will flow off without sealing up, and slow enough that it won't erode, which is 0.2% slope. So what that is, is 20 centimetres Rise or fall over 100 metres. We come back up here to our one metre 
fall at 20, 40, 68 centimetres. So 2% slope is 20 centimetres fall in 100. Very seldom will you be doing a bank 100 metres long. I wouldn't advise it. I'd rather see four short banks. The average fence line in Australia that's been graded on both sides, you know, you've got a blade this side and a blade the other on the neighbour's fence, something like that. You've got five or six metres here, five or six metres there, um, 15, 18 metres, something like that, and one wedge to the other. The average bank is going to be 25, up to 25 metres long. So we bring that back. The only one you really have to remember here is five centimetres, rise and fall over 25 metres. That's what I was sure refer to the Shane Warne Quicker score. Five wickets for 25 runs. So if our, but if our bank is longer than, well, I'm not, I should put paces. If it's over what I think is 25 paces, I'll start checking it because the longer the bank, we're getting more critical. So if our bank is 30 metres long, we've got six for 30, seven for 35, eight for 40, 10 for 50, but eventually we get back to that 20 for 100. So when we go out in the field this afternoon, that's what we're going to be looking for. We're going to be looking for, we'll pack, design a erosion from each diverse and bank thing, worst case scenario stuff. We're going to need a fair bit of dirt. We've got to find the contour line. And it's a scientific fact that water flows at right end of the contour line. So we'll, we'll make sure that our water is flowing away from us. Um, and we'll have a bank in, whatever the length of the bank, in at that given slope percentage. So if our bank that we saw this afternoon is 20 metres long, we're going to have a five centimetre rise on it. So that's going to be enough to turn the water, steer it into the hole, and then flow off, reinstate the natural flow direction. At this stage of the game, it's all Chinese. When we start to get out there this afternoon, this morning, this afternoon, um, everybody got that? Now there's our hillside, here's our water flows, here's our roadway. So I come onto the property, I get the manager, go for a drive. First thing he does is take me down and show me this big washout. What are we going to do there? Nothing. Because that's the result. The water slow has been coming from up here, flowing down the road, crowded this washout. I'm not going to do anything with that. I'm wasting my time. I could, I could make it look pretty, but I get the same feeling hugging a tree. So now I turn around and drive back up the slope. These are never up the top. They're always down the bottom because the water's built up. You know, it's coming off here, getting through the wind rows, starting to come this way. Um, so it's coming down here, so now I have to go back and find the, the top of the slope. So I go back up here, here's the crown, the ridge. You know, just a gentle ridge, red soil ridge. So in this sense, it's a 2% slope. It's feel like black soil country around Long Reach, long big ridge running right up. It could be a kilometre from here back up to here. So the handouts, the bank spacing can indicate four bank, four equal parts. The most important bank of the whole lot is this one up here. Everybody wants to start down here because that's where the washout is. But the most important one is this one up here because if we put that one in and it rains, it's going to have an effect down here. There's now one quarter of the catchment going away. If we put that one in and we blow a tyre or grouse plate falls off the D6 or whatever the hell it is, um, and we have to leave the job. That one up there is having... If we did this one first and the grouse plate falls off the dozer and we get four inches of rain, this one's not going to handle it. There's a million litres coming down here at 100 k an hour. This bank won't handle it. Because there's a quarter of the catchment going off here now, I don't know how big that catchment is. You know, it could be 100 hectares. You've had three or four inches of rain in the last few days. The ground's wet. A centimetre of water over hectares is 10,000 litres. So there could be, you know, 500 hectares of, of catchment out in there. So now you've got... That bank there now is getting rid of 250,000 litres of water flowing off. Because that water's not coming in and pushing the water in front of it, well, this water in here, it's like a chain. The water will drag the water behind it, or the water, weight of the water behind it will push, push, pull. Because this water, this water in here can now slow down. It's losing all its energy. It comes through the grass. It gets on the road. It's starting to build up pace. This water now can slow down because this water's not pushing it. Now it's doing 75 kilometres an hour. Another 250,000 litres. 50 kilometres an hour. Another 250. So all this one is handling is that catchment in there. And it's coming in slowly. It's not building up any pace. It's flowing off another 250. That's where that million litres of water comes in at 100k an hour. So we start up the top. And people tell me, oh, I put it in a bank, but it blew out. I knew they put this one in and not that one. So you always look at the top. Find out where the problem is. Where's that water coming from? Where did it used to go? Don't look at this. That's just an indication of 
where it finished up. But that's where the problem is, back up the top. Anyway, so we come along here. Now, what it is, is that here's our washout down here. As we're driving back up, we're starting to have a look at the country. Why is all that water, why can't that water get across there? It's because of our windrows. If we're there early enough, we cut a little hole in the windrow with the greater blade. That might have been enough to let the water go. So we haven't got this washout and all that sort of thing. Or we're starting to look, shit, there's a little bit of a gully that is coming through there, but our big windrow's blocked it off, so that water can't get through and in, in, you know, can't go across the gully. It's hitting that windrow, coming down here and getting in here now, like that. So we opened that windrow up. We're starting to look, when I'm grading a fire break in May, like on a boundary fence, I know the grader won't be back there until next year. So if there's a bit of a ripple down the road, I'm looking, what caused that? How do I stop that? And if I'm early enough, I can pick up a bit of windrow soil, scratch all that up into a little, little bit of a wall across the road. <clears throat> the most common, thing, most common thing I do at home now is I've got a ripple coming down the fence line. There's a fence line coming down here. The most common thing I do to get enough soil, because there's insufficient soil, there's insufficient soil in the windrows and that sort of stuff, I'll estimate the condor line, I'll back off and cut it, I'll put a flat bottom drain in and then bring that dirt up the road here. So I've got a check bank across the road, I've got a flat bottom drain running out for five, ten metres and that's the most common thing that I'm not necessarily surveying, say I survey every structure I put in. 90% of my work is just bringing it, soil up into a flat bottom drain, put a check bank over the fence line on the roadway, whatever, and go off and leave it. Yeah, there's no soil. I need soil from somewhere, so I've got to bring soil in from outside. So I've got that big, wide, flat bottom drain, bring the soil up, you know, so that water can turn, come in there, get in there, and take it off. Um, but that comes back to that one up there. But in this instance now, we're taking a look at the, at the terrain. Like there's a patch of brigalow here. I'm not going to back a $100,000 grader in a patch of brigalow. Take tyres and smash mirrors and all that sort of shit. So, what, or if it's a fence line, quite often the strainer post. It's a brand new fence line. We don't want to cut a brand new fence. We might open it up on the strainer post. Then put our bank through you know, on the strainer post. So what actually happens in real life is a bit different to the handouts will indicate. The handouts will indicate a bank spacing of whatever, 200 metres, 300, 500 metres, depending on the slope and the soil. But what happens in real life is the, the fence line or the strainer post or the scrub, the terrain, we're starting to look more at the country. That little bit of a, there used to be a little bit of a rocky ridge in there. We've graded that out because it was annoying our vehicles. If we can reinstate that little rocky ridge and get rid of the windows, that's right. But for whatever reason, we're here on Kelly and James decided he wants to build a bank there. So the road is deep, we need a fair bit of soil. What we do is set up the surveying gear, take a reading in here of 1.5. Now most of us are somewhere between 5 foot 2 and 6 foot 2 tall. We're only working short distance. Everything reading, all the reading we do today will be between 1, 2 and, and 1, 8, somewhere like that, because we're only working short and it depends on how hot it is. So I'm just using that as an example. So somewhere I hope the water is going to flow to that creek. So I'm just going to make sure that it's flowing away. So in this sense, as I start down in here, I might take three or four readings until I eventually find that level line. That's a dead level line. Water flows at right end to that. That's a condor line and scientific flat. So, okay, I'm, if I, I'm going to dig a hole in here now and use that dirt to put a bank over the road. So that first reading there, it's the start of the hole. The second reading is the end of the hole to get that condor line. This becomes reading three. That's going to be the low end of the bank, the bottom end of the diversion bank. So I walk over the road, I know what I'm looking for over here now. I'm looking for that high end of the diversion bank. I'm looking for a lower number on the staff. This is the full extent of the mathematics involved with dividing a diversion bank. So when I come over the road here, I know when I walk over here, I'm looking for 145. That's a lower number, the staff's gone up the slope, I get a known number, it's a catch 22 of surveying. Is the lower the number, the higher up the ridge the staff has gone. As the staff goes down the ridge, so that number gets higher. So that's the full extent of surveying a diversion bank. That's 90% of my formal presentation just in that drawing there. 90% of the surveying just in all, just in that little bit there. Is how to dig that hole 
you know, how, where to put the hole and all. If, for example, sake, we can't find that 1.5 there, if it's over here, it might mean I've got an optical illusion. I think the water's flowing to the creek, but it might be on the side of a ridge. The water's actually flowing this way. So if I build a bank there, that water's going to get to that and flow straight back in again. Complete waste of time. Just set your, get, get that dome, that base level, oh, yeah. and then undo that screw and move that. Because the more level that is, the more room you have on that, on that uni joint. Hmm. Now, the best way of this is to hold the base. Just hold that base down because what it, it binds on the aluminium. So you hold the base down once it's, as long as the bubble's in the circle. Because yeah. at 100 metres, we might be allowed five mil. I'm not worried about the millimetres. So, and then if you really were, you just adjust those little wheels to get it back central. Yeah. Yeah. As long as the bubble's in the circle. We're right. Yeah, they, can you see the crosshairs? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what, we got a number? Yeah, it's like the one just above the 1.5 here. The next red dot up. So in there, so top of that E is five. That, that E just represents a block of five. So if you're on top of that, so that's 1.5.6. Yeah, it's just between them. Yeah, yeah. Well, just going, now it's just a matter of walking 50 paces. So you've got one, five, six. Now he's going down the slope, fairly steep slope. Yeah. He's probably going to have to put that staff right up to get 50 paces. I'm just saying that slope percentage have worked out over 100 metres. We're going to get him to go 50 and we'll round it out and double it, just to give us that. <laughs> You're right, he's got it ready. So we had two, nine, five, one, five, six. There's four is nine, uh, is three, one, three, nine. So I'll round that up to 140. That's over 50 metres. So that's 280 over 100 metres. That here is 2.8% slope. On a 3% slope, on moderate to low soil road, what's your bank spacing here? Uh, 200. Hey? Yeah, as easy as that. On low to soil, yeah. They're 200 metres apart. Yeah, bank, metres. Yeah, 3% yeah. slope. Yeah. So on high soil erodibility, at 3% slope, it's going to be different again. Because we can't on that grass, like we know in this case it's a lawn and it's watered and that sort of stuff. But then when you know your country, you know, you know the vegetation, because grass is the best erosion control measure ever invented. So once the more grass, the less, less speed the water's building up and that sort of thing. But that's how easy it is to come up the slope percentage. Just work, do it over 50 metres, or on real steep slopes, I've did it over 25 metres. You know, on a mountain slope, you'll do it over, yeah. So, the, yeah, so the slope, will determine your bank spacings. Most of this country here is going to be the upper the way around. If you're that flat, yeah. then you'll get point. Like with uh, Glen, Glen Orr Station going into Normandon, the natural lay of the ground there is 0.2% slope. Going into the station, the road going in, you drive along and you're almost at eye level with the roadway. Yeah. The road's that, the water's that, the ground's that flat, but for 80k, and it's just down barrel straight for 80k, the water gets into the road and the, the road becomes a creek, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so it is, yeah, fairly critical that now the road's been there for 100 years. You know, the first bullock team's dragging a bloody lump of road rail line behind them and that sort of shit. Now it's graders. And it's not saying coming in tonight that the, ro the erosion on, on whatever property you're on was originally caused by a 112 horsepower grader with a 12 foot blade. So now you've got graders down there with 14 foot blades and 180 horsepower. The erosion that's happened on those properties in the last 30 years is nothing that's going to happen in the next 10 because we've got bigger machines, more powerful machines, more dirt getting shifted. And you go back to these, some of these places around here now and you can work out, like talk to Peter when he come in here, it was bad, place would run down and all that sort of stuff. They probably didn't have a grader. Would have been just two wheel track through the scrub getting into town once every six months. But yeah, the first graders come in with old 12 E's and that's what they were. So, yeah. so you see that, so imagine that road going out from here back to the Bitchman now and another, well that road won't be there in 10 years time. It's that far below ground level now in most places, yeah, especially through the, yeah. So all the more reason with our bigger machines, we can hopefully put it right. Yeah, well, the young fellas like this, all you fellas here now, so you're here at the right time to start, well, okay, the old fellas stuffed up. It's going to be in your role somewhere, you know, whether you're back in Perth or back in Bertie 
long reach for every yard and start fixing up all the old fella stuff up. <laughs> And you, it's the same here this morning, you can't make an omelette without breaking egg. You're going to have to disturb grass and soil to get a, a roadway. We want a fire break. We want to go about to get the boards. You've got to better get trucks and road trains in and all that sort of shit. So you're going to move the ground, but what we're going to try to do is minimise our soil loss. And even if you have to go down to bare ground, but at least you're going to put in banks and all that sort of shit. Now the size of a bank will be turned by the traffic. And if it's a Toyota Land Cruiser going around the boundary once every bloody three or four months, it's it's like that. And if it's a body truck, carting a truckload of horses, it's like that. Now the height there is the same, but the width is, if, if it's a road train, it's like that. The height's still the same, but you, you, because the trucks get up and over it right. They've got to be designed for trucks to drive over. The first thing, if they're not designed, if they're not easy to drive over, people start to drive around them. Well then the graders will go around and follow the wheel tracks and all that sort of stuff. So you got to, but the traffic will determine the size of a bank. And there are man-made structures where you're going to require some form of maintenance and that sort of thing in the future. I've built banks like that now in the short term. Um, but with maintenance, now I'm on a 140, third gear, flat, great and full throttle, and up and over and just keep going. Because there's me bank built like that in the first place. So when I come along, I know it's there, I mark them. And I use the white plates off the hallways because then you see the reflectors at night time and stuff like that. But as he comes up, here's his front wheels there. There's the greater frame coming back. Here's his jewels back here. There's his blade in there. All that dirt's getting left in there. So I'm not actually doing anything into the crown of it because I'm losing more dirt in there. I'm actually building the ramps up. So, and then when you build them in this time of year, there's no subsoil moisture. You build them 30% higher than what you need because they're going to settle. So you make them high like that and after rainfall has come down a bit anyway because it's settled down with a bit of moisture in that in it. Even if it's still too high, there's no reason why you can't take the height off because you're going to lose it back in there so the ramps are getting better. Now it's more important to have a ramp behind the bank than in front of the bank. Because we've got, well I'll draw this, turn it around. So here's our hillside, here's our water flows, here's our roadway, here's our erosion control measure here. Um, we don't want to big long ramp in front of it. So if we build that out there for a truck access, that water there's got to turn and come back around. It won't do it. What'll happen, it'll come around the wrong way and or make that soak in there and get boggy. So you have a big long ramp behind, because then that water can get away. There's, so you can have a ramp to this ground level, so you'll have a bank like that, big long ramp, so the trucks can get across. So your step tanks aren't to get caught up. So you can have a ramp behind the bank, but yeah. now. People say, oh, how do trucks get across them banks? What about them two grids between here and the highway? What do they like to cross over with a truck? How come them truck drivers go across them and don't complain? Because he knows they're there. He can see them there. There's one of them got tyres tacked up on it. And, you know, when you come up, you see all the tyres. So he knows he's got to drop back five or six years. He's coming down there at 80k an hour. He's got to drop back to 30, get up and over them grids with a you know, triple road train coming in. So the same thing, and these are marked. That one speaker on that DVD, that Paul Stone, uh, 60k from Kelkering into Sanford. There's about 80 banks on it. Now, I defy anybody here to find any more than 10 of them. <coughs> what he does when he puts the bank in, he puts a, a 44 gallon drum uh, lid on a picket. It's got the speed bump logo on it like that. He's got the uh, he's got erosion control written around written around the top of it. Erosion control. There's a truck driver knows there's a speed hump, and it's 200 metres. So he knows he's got to back off because there's a speed hump sitting in front of him. Now them truck drivers, they have never heard a truck driver complain about one of these things because he knew it was there. He knew he had to back off to go across them. Yeah. And I'm talking about RTA trucks, you know, buddy six decks and buddy cattle coming in and going out, whatever like that. Because he knows, he knows there's a speed hump sitting in front of him with a logo, but he's not an idiot, it's a road control measure. So as long as they're marked and identified, you know, at home now, the boys at where I work now, if they go to work at seven o'clock in the morning, they come home at five o'clock and they see a white chemical drum on a picket, they know that I've been there. There's another bank being put in. So they, you know, they learn to back off and come across them. Yeah. And being a pitcher that appreciate a good road, but didn't have oh, big yeah. and problems in it as well. Well, right? so that, that same speak on that DVD, that Paul Stone, he said a speed bump is better to drive over than along or across a washout. So in the short term, you might have to go back to third gear to get over a bank on the road, but it's better than to go to first gear to sneak down a washout.
Today uh, we're on the side here, sort of, we had a really good group of, well I count 16 people all up, but 14 that haven't attended previous workshops, so it's really good attendance for this region. And the, kids, the uh, principal here to have that the manager, James, had concerns with some, some floor loss on a different road, so provided the venue and the, and the Tonkin toy for me to play with, but basically to have a look at the road and just, yeah, just to highlight the need for the the uh, need for surveying, the dumpy levels, the use of dumpy levels. We've had represented quite a few properties here this morning. Uh, it's a terrible sight from my point of view, but really good from the levelling exercise. The fact that all the participants here today had to do a lot of levelling, understand the need for levelling, because that will tell us for sure which way the water flows and that sort of thing. Um, I would have liked the site with a bit more slope to it. It's a lot easier for young participants to understand it all, but you've got to make do with whatever is provided. Um, so it was good in that respect, but really good from the levelling exercise. Um, so basically what we did was uh, peg a diversion bank um, with the outlet and the sill, that type of thing, and this long cave, about a 30 metre bank, and installed it with the grader. So, uh, yeah, um, unfortunately the ground was that flat, there's not a lot of variation. We weren't able to, able to do some of the other techniques, but at least we've done the dead one bank as the display, um, and the Batista bit surveyed it. Well, it's, it's been proven to me in the past that, especially the young fellows, they'll sit up the back of the room, they don't make much comment, but uh, today most all these young fellows joined in, they've all had a go at it, and to me it's like planting a seed. You hope that that seed will strike somewhere, and I've had instances where 10 years later, a young fellow's been at a workshop and come back as a station manager and realised, well, gee, it's time to do something about it. Yes, I think that as long as my bum pointing, can't, pointing around, I can't fix 1% of Australia. But if these young fellows go home, the managers go home and fix 1% of the property, we're having a win. And the young fellows that are just working on the properties now, you don't know where they're going to be in 10 years' time. So that information goes with them. And it's Australia-wide. The, the principles and the guidelines we've used here today apply all over Australia. So it's not wasted. It, you can't put a dollar value on it, but um, basically I think it's, it's very cheap, very, yeah, it's definitely effective. Cool. <laughs>